Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 262, The Science of Math. Last time we talked about the Earth and the heavens, i.e. we started to get into astronomy. But the scientific revolution addressed so many more aspects of life, and fairly early on. As we're going to see today, the scientific revolution had a profound impact on the field of mathematics. Now, mathematics was not its own discipline in the year 1450. It was considered to be a part of philosophy. Imagine that today. You sign up to major in philosophy, and then you're required to take an advanced calculus class. I can imagine some philosophy majors I knew in college who would have been very annoyed slash terrified at that idea. The scientific revolution is going to free mathematics from philosophy. Without that first severing, I don't think we ever get to calculus. Or we likely don't. So today, we digest changes that were wrought in the field of the mathematics by the scientific revolution. Double-entry bookkeeping goes back to at least the 13th century. The principle of double-entry is simple. Every transaction is entered twice, as a credit and a debit. So if I buy a bar of gold worth, let's say, $500, I credit $500 to my current account, and I debit $500 to my list of assets. If I borrow $500, then $500 is a debit to my current account and a credit to my list of liabilities. In the Renaissance, the standard system involved three books. First, there was a waste book, in which you recorded everything exactly as it happened, in as much detail as possible. You could refer to this in the event of a future dispute or confusion. Then there was a register, in which you turned your record into a list of transaction. Then the account book proper, with debits and credits on facing pages. If you check the account book against the register, and the debits against the credits, then you could be confident that the books were accurate. And every time you balanced the books, you could establish whether you were making money or losing money. Accounting thus became the basis for rational investment choices and made it possible to decide how to divide up the profits of a partnership. Teaching bookkeeping was one of the main ways by which Italian mathematicians actually earned a living. There was a whole school for this. Now, there seems to be no connection, of course, between bookkeeping and science. But Galileo, who probably could have taught bookkeeping himself when he was scrabbling a living together in the years between 1585, when he ceased to be a university student, and in 1589, when he obtained his first university appointment. When people complained to Galileo that his law of falling did not correspond to the real world, because falling objects do not accelerate continuously, since they are held back by air resistance, he would reply that there was simply no contradiction between the world of theory and the real world. Because, to quote him now, what happens in the concrete happens the same way in the abstract. It would be novel indeed if computations and ratios made in abstract numbers should not thereafter correspond to concrete gold and silver coins and merchandise. Just as the bookkeeper, who wants his calculations to deal with sugar, silk, and wool, must discount the boxes, bales, and other packings, so the mathematical scientist, when he wants to organize in the concrete the effects which he has proven in the abstract, must deduct the material hindrances, and if he is able to do so, I assure you that things are in no less agreement than arithmetical computations. The error is then lie not in the abstract or concreteness, not in the geometry or physics, but in a calculator who does not know how to make a true accounting, unquote. Double-entry bookkeeping thus represented an attempt to make the real world, the world of bolts of silk and bales of wool and bags of sugar, mathematically legible. The process of abstraction it teaches is an essential precondition for this new science. In Galileo's day, the other main source of mathematics in Europe was in painting. Specifically, 
in the principles of perspective representation. Perspective painting was a more recent invention than double-entry bookkeeping. It began between 1401 and 1413 with Filippo Brunaschelli. Brunaschelli had learned that perspective drawing required establishing a picture plan through which the scene is viewed. Then, the artist creates an image that corresponds to how it would appear if a piece of glass was placed over the plane. There needed to be a point of perspective and, eventually, a vanishing point. All of this required math. Brunaschelli had learned something of enormous importance. For perspective painting to work, the artist and the viewer had to have their eye located in the same place. While this wasn't a vanishing point yet, per se, European painters, for the first time in history, were on their way. Roughly two decades separate Brunaschelli's first studies and the real first large-scale painting, which fully masters the technique of perspective representation. This is Macciocho's famous painting of the Trinity, created in 1425. Massachiotto painting shows Christ on the cross in front of a chapel with a barrel vault. But of course, the chapel does not exist. It is entirely a painted chapel. Here is the difference between Brunaschelli's studies and Massaccio's painting. Brunaschelli was representing reality. Massaccio is representing an imaginary space. You can use the various picture plane techniques to paint reality, but if you want to paint an imaginary world, then you have to work out how to construct that world so that it appears convincing and aesthetically satisfying. You have to decide where you want the vanishing point and or the distance points to be. You have to sketch out a grid of conveying lines. You have to apply the principles of geometry. And this is exactly what Mascaccio did. We can see the lines he scored in the plaster on which he painted. We know that Brunaschelli discussed perspective with Mascaccio. And soon, another artist, Alberti, would write a textbook on geometric perspective. Perspective painting involves the application of theory to particular circumstances. It trains the eye to think in terms of geometric shapes. By the middle of the 15th century, artists had begun to think about shapes differently. There could be finite, infinite, abstract, and undifferentiated space. This is truly the advent of the use of space in art. Today, types of space in art include positive space, negative space, deep and shallow space, and three-dimensional space. Positive space refers to objects that stand out from the negative surrounding or background. Deep space refers to the depth, and shallow space refers to the lack of depth. All of these ideas get their beginning in the 15th century, and they are essentially math. It's hard to express how important this innovation was for the purpose of invention. Before perspective drawing, if you wanted to design a piece of machinery, you had to make it or a model of it. But once they had perspective drawing, you could design with only a pencil, itself invented in 1560. Da Vinci is a great exemplar here. He designed hundreds of contraptions that were never built and frankly could never be built. But the fact that his ideas could not be converted into a physical model no longer held him back from dreaming and inventing. Perspective painting made the impossible possible. The other major revolution to humankind's understanding of the world was the engraved plate, first used in 1543. Engraved plates allowed printers to easily, relatively speaking, put images into books. Images 
that used perspective. Thus, by 1543, two revolutions come together to make a new type of science. On the one hand, there was perspective painting, grounded in geometrical abstraction. On the other, the printing of engraved plates, supplemented by text produced on a printing press. Perspective painting goes back to 1425, engraved prints to at least 1428, the printing press to 1450. The fall of Constantinople, one consequence of which was a flood of Greek manuscripts and Greek-speaking scholars entering the Latin-speaking West from the East, occurred in 1453. Why then did it take a further century to complete the transformation brought about by the mechanical reproduction of perspective images? There's two answers to this question. First, the immediate priority of publishers in the years after the invention of printing was to publish the vast body of religious, philosophical, and literary texts which had been inherited from the past. First, the Latin texts, and then, for a more limited audience, the Greek ones. The first reliable edition of Galen, on which Vesalius had worked, appeared in Basel in 1538. Second, a long cultural revolution still had to take place, in which book learning came to seem of lesser importance than direct experience. That revolution began with Columbus. In 1464, a German astronomer, Johannes Müller, known as Regio Montanus, Regio Montanus was a version of the place he came for, Konisberg in Latin, gave a lecture at the University of Padua. Regio Montanus had recently completed an exposition and commentary on Ptolemy's astronomy, begun by his mentor, George Purebuck. This was to become the standard textbook in advanced astronomy for the whole of the 16th century. And in it, Purebuck and Regio Montanus did not hesitate to criticize Ptolemy for his errors. In 1464, Regio Montanus was writing on a path-breaking guide to plane and spherical trigonometry, which laid out the mathematical foundations for astronomical calculations. He had learned Greek in Vienna in order to read Ptolemy in the original, and in Italy he had been able to read in Greek Archimedes, who had been translated into Latin in the Middle Ages but was not yet available in print. Regio Montanus was the first to really benefit from the supply of ancient Greek texts that reached Italy after the fall of Constantinople. At the time of his lecture in Padua, less than a decade after the publication of the Gutenberg Bible, the printing revolution was only just beginning to get underway. Euclid, for example, was first printed in Latin in 1484, in Greek in 1533, and finally in Italian in 1543 and English in 1570. Regio Montanus's lecture thus marks a key moment in the reacquisition of Greek mathematics and points towards the ambitious program for the publication of mathematical texts that Regio Montanus developed, though he died, as I'll talk about more in later episodes, before it could be carried out. Regio Montanus also spoke in praise of the mathematical sciences, and he praised them by denigrating Aristotelian philosophy taught in the universities. Even Aristotle, he wrote, if he came back to life, would not be able to make sense of what was said by his modern disciples. In 1471, Regio Montanus worked out a procedure for measuring the parallax of heavenly bodies and so their distance from the earth. His procedure presumed the use of what was called a cross staff, which was an instrument invented by a Jewish rabbi, Levi ben Gerson, in 1328. It's a very simple instrument. Essentially, it's just a calibrated shaft along which a bar slides. You sight the shaft and move the bar back and forth until you've lined up its ends with two points, and the angle can then be read off the scale from the shaft. You can use a cross staff, for example, to measure the angle between the horizon and the sun at midday. If you know the date and you have the right tables, you can then read off your latitude. This, of course, involves squinting at the sun, which a lot of pilots in the early age of the Age of Discovery wind up going blind from. 
Alternatively, at night, you could measure latitude directly by measuring the angle between the horizon and the pole star. The cross staff is merely one of a series of instruments, such as the quadrant or sextant, designed for measuring angles by taking sightings. Before it was invented, the Astrolab had provided a sighting device, and also a method for measuring the height of the sun from its shadow. Again, with this device, you can establish your latitude if you know your time of day. But more importantly for most users, you could tell the time of day if you know your latitude and the date. Specialist forms of all these instruments were developed for surveying, for astronomy, for navigation. But the basic principle that angles could be used to determine distances or times was the same for all of them. So what we're seeing in the early part of the scientific revolution is for the first time, math is getting consistent and consistently used amongst different practitioners. In surveying, if you know how far away a building was, it was now easy to calculate its height. Suppose you wanted to scale the walls of a fortress, which were on the other side of a river. You could take two measurements in a straight line with the building and from the distance between the measurements and the difference between the angles as measured with a cross staff, you could calculate the height of the walls and make your ladders to the right height. The basic principles involved had been described by Euclid and were well understood in the Middle Ages. They are exactly the same principles as are involved in perspective painting. But where perspective painting takes a three-dimensional world and turns it into a two-dimensional surface, Reggio Montanus was now trying to take a two-dimensional image, the night sky, and turn it into a three-dimensional world. To do so, you have to, in effect, move from monocular vision to binocular vision. So the principle of the parallax is what enables mathematicians to do this. It's a variation of the basic principle that if you know one angle and one side of an equilateral or right-sided triangle, you can determine the other angles and sides. It thus requires not one measurement, but two. For example, hold your finger up in front of you, not if you're driving. Close your left eye, again, not if you're driving. And note where your finger appears to be against the background. Then switch eyes. Immediately, your finger is going to jump to the right. If you know your distance between your eyes and measure the angle that corresponds to the apparent shift in your finger's position, you can calculate exactly how far away your finger is. Although, of course, no one's going to do that. In this case, the distance between your eye is a significant portion of the distance between your eyes and your fingers. If you were trying to measure the distance to an object that was very far away, you would have to set up two observation spots that were far apart, or at least would seem to be. Reggio Montanus grasped that an astronomer does not have to travel in order to get two observation points that are, in effect, far apart. If the heavens rotate around the center of the universe, and if that center is at or near the center of the Earth, then the observation point of the astronomer, who is on the surface of the Earth, changes in its relationship to the heavens, as they move simply because the astronomer is not looking at the heavens from the center of the universe, but from a point that is distant from the center. So imagine you're standing at the immediate dead center of a merry-go-round, or a carousel, on which horses are arranged in concentric circles. At the center is a stationary round platform, around which the circle of horses, each taking the same time to complete a circuit, revolve. As you look outwards and the horses turn around you, the relative position of the horses will remain the same. A horse which is in line with another horse at one moment will still be in line with it a quarter of a revolution later. But if you take a few steps in any direction until you reach the edge of the stationary platform, then the relative position of the horses will appear to change all the time. Perspective changes. Moreover, if you know the size of the stationary platform, and the distance to the outer ring of the horses, then you can use changes in relative position of the horses in the two other rings to work out how far away they are. 
in essence, Reggio Montanus figured out that you could measure the parallax of heavenly bodies by taking two observations from the same place, but at different times. Rather than taking two observations from different places, but at the same time. Although Reggio Montanus worked out how to make such a measurement in 1471, the full account of this procedure didn't get published until 1531. Unfortunately, in 1548, a text, apparently by Reggio Montanus, was published which claimed to measure the parallax of the comet which had appeared in 1472 and to confirm that it was as close to the Earth because the parallax was a whopping 6 degrees, placing it much closer than the Moon, which had a diurnal parallax of about 1 degree. Now, sadly, recent historians have established that this particular paper was not written by Reggio Montanus. It was found amongst his papers when he died, and was presumably in his handwriting. However, he didn't write it. He might have been working on it, he might have been copying something on it, but we know that no one in the 16th century realized this, and that turned out to be the cause of a lot of confusion. Then, in 1572, the world changed again. Astronomer Tycho Brahe noticed a new star in the sky. For a time, it was the brightest object in the heavens, other than the sun and the moon, brighter even than Venus. Such events only occur once in a thousand years or so, and unlike a comet, the new star stood still, which made it much easier to measure its parallax. All over Europe, astronomers were literally obsessed with it, since they now knew Regio Montanus's real technique for measuring parallax, they naturally tried to apply it. Some found a measurable parallax, but others insisted that they couldn't. It didn't exist. Accurately measuring parallax from far was easy, particularly as it required a more exact measurement of time than a 16th century clock could provide, but showing that there was no measurable parallax was much more straightforward. All one had to do was hold up a thread as a sighting device and find two stars that were exactly in line with this new one, but north or south of it. If the same stars were exactly in line with the nova later that same night, then there was no parallax. This simple technique was actually employed by the teacher of Johannes Kepler later on. And if there was no parallax, then the comet must be a vast distance away far further than the moon, whose parallax was quite easy to measure. And it must be supralunary, not a sublunary body. But how to explain the appearance of a new star in the heavens? Since there could be no natural explanation, assuming the star was indeed the heavens, the event was just a miracle sent by God. The finest astronomers and astrologers, including Thomas Diggs in England, racked their brains in an attempt to figure out what it might portend, and hastened to publish their conflicting conclusions. Making matters more complicated, the new star of 1572 was followed by a new comet of 1577. And here again, parallax measurement placed the comet far beyond the moon. Where a nova or a new star could possibly be regarded as a miracle, a comet was too commonplace to be handled in that way. Brahe worked out a further problem that could be solved by measuring parallax, a crucial difference between the Ptolemaic system on the one hand and the Copernican system on the other, was that under these modern systems, Mars must at all times approach much closer to the Earth than under the Ptolemaic system. Brahe at first thought he had obtained a reliable figure for the parallax of Mars, which proved the Ptolemaic system was mistaken, although he later realized there were problems with that. Reggio Montanus's procedure for measuring parallax ideally involved comparing the apparent position of a celestial object soon after dark with its apparent position 
not long before dawn, thus maximizing the parallax to be measured. Neither the new star of 1572 nor the comet of 1577 set in the night sky viewed from northern Europe, so the ideal procedure was inapplicable. In the case of Mars, there was no choice but to make measurements when the planet was nearly in line with the sun, and thus it never rose high above the horizon at night. In measuring the location of an object near the horizon, Rahe had to allow for the refraction caused by the greater thickness of the atmosphere which with its rays had passed. And eventually, what he found was that he had miscalculated this. But as was the case in many times in the scientific revolution, what mattered not was that the individual was wrong. The fact that Tycho Brahe was wrong about Mars didn't make a difference. What mattered was his method was right. And the observations that he took day after day, night after night, proved instrumental for later astronomers who were able to correct the error. Again, this all gets down to whether or not Europeans are allowed to question knowledge. Under the ancient classical system, the answer is absolutely not. And so even if you don't understand any of the stuff about parallaxes and so on and so forth, and I only loosely grasp it, what you should come away with is understanding that for the first time, people were willing to take math and try to apply it in new, in unique ways to the world in a way in which our understanding of the natural world became so much more systematized, so much easier to measure. And this is a great example of a few fundamental features of the scientific revolution. The first is inevitability. Once Reggio Montanus developed a system for measuring parallax and published it, astronomers were set on a path that could only lead to proving Aristotle and Ptolemy were wrong. The second feature is time. Delays in publication meant that it took a long time for the inevitable conclusions to hit home. But ultimately, that would not matter. Because of a shift in the mindset from Europeans, from theorizing and logical argument to experimentation and objective proofs, once a discovery had been made, there was no unmaking it. Not that some didn't try. We'll get into the Inquisition here in a few weeks when I discuss reactions to the scientific revolution. And while I do not want to overly belabor the point, the second fundamental feature of the scientific revolution remains the impact of the printing press. Printing made it possible for Brahe to survey a wide range of publications. Before he turned his gaze to the skies, he looked to a book. Well, multiple books. None of which would have been possible without printing. Historians of science have often, and rightly, suggested that the key to the scientific revolution is the mathematization of nature. Aristotle and Ptolemy had assumed that the heavens were mathematically legible, and indeed, Ptolemy had devised techniques for reading them. One aspect of the scientific revolution consists in the extension of mathematical theories to include sublunary phenomena. Where Aristotelian physics was preoccupied with qualities, the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and embody the four qualities, hot, dry, cold, and wet, you'll remember that from the four humors, the new physics was preoccupied with movements and quantities that could be measured, and it quickly led to attempts to measure the speed of falling bodies, the speed of sound, and the weight of air. Where Aristotle had assumed that each element behaved differently, the new physics assumed that all heavy objects could be thought of as the same. Where Aristotelian physics had depended on all five senses, the new physics relied only on sight. 
while traditional histories suggest that the mathematization of science started in the 17th century with new physics, really, we do get a glimpse of it much earlier through perspective painting. Galileo learned math from Ostelio Ricci, who by trade was a teacher of perspective to artists, not astronomers. The amazing thing is how an innovation in one field can now jump to another. It can lead to innovations in other seemingly unconnected branches of science. In the 16th century, perspective and coordinators made the jump from perspective painting to geography. Now, there wasn't necessarily anything new about this. Cicero had thought that geography was a branch of geometry. With geometry came abstraction. Perspective is represented with two parallel lines converging towards a vanishing point. It's, in fact, a grid used by artists to establish a picture plane. And the exact same thing can be done to establish latitude and longitude. Geometry, by the way, also acquired new importance as a result of the invention of gunpowder. Fortifications had to be built to resist cannonballs, which fly in straight lines, at least as a bird sees them. In order to provide raking and flanking fire along every wall, forts needed to be designed on the page with very carefully measured angles and distances. Thus, if we were to ask how the scientific revolution became mathematized, the answer is clear. Perspective painting led to cartography, which led to navigation and proper astronomy, and ultimately to ballistics. And in many cases, all of these changes and innovations happened simultaneously, with one technique jumping seamlessly from one branch of science to the next. These were like real things, too, that made a difference in the actual world. In 1622, for example, a fleet of Dutch ships tried to seize the Portuguese colony of Macau. A Jesuit mathematician did the geometry calculations to determine the distance to a stockpile of gunpowder the Dutch had brought ashore and the angle of elevation at which the cannon should be set. A direct hit turned the tide of that battle and ensured that Macau remained a Portuguese colony. Thus, if we ask how did the scientific revolution become mathematized, the answer is through the different fields that I've already laid out. And of course, and again, I don't want to keep belaboring this point, but the answer is also because of printing. Because printing allowed the spread of ideas from one branch of science to the next, and often within the same. Frankly, first and foremost, we might want to think about the scientific revolution as a revolt, a revolt by the mathematicians against the authority of philosophers, an authority they had held for thousands of years. We'll end it there for today before continuing with the scientific revolution next week. As always, if you would like additional content, click on any of the links in the show notes. You can access the website. You can now do a free seven-day trial of the Patreon account and see what extra benefits patrons do acquire depending upon their tier. And if you'd like, you can check out a seven-day free trial of Western Civ 2.0. You can get the whole story. We go all the way back to Mesopotamia again from the beginning, but in much greater detail and with much better audio quality at the outset.